Hello, hello. I'll wait for some people to drop in. It is three o'clock and I am I am wanting to to again give voices with the QA project and share the mic. I am wanting to give voices to black athletes who are who might be struggling right now and trying to figure out ways to kind of cope and maneuver. I had a, a great conversation with Maya McClendon about mental health and how we're doing. And I want to, I want to bring in um, uh, another athlete that I know from Louisville and her name is Janelle. And she, I'm wanting her to just share her experience as um, as it pertains to being a black female and again a, a predominantly white sport and I really just encourage whoever is on and watching to ask questions I see all the questions I see everyone that is joining in but I, I really do want you all to ask questions and feel engaged in this process to to kind of put our heads together to think of ways that we can we can all get through this because um, if if nothing else, we all want to see justice, we all want to see equality, and we all want to see um, our world be better for those that are, are not as privileged as, as we may be. Even myself, um, um, I just want to help and be able to, to lend a hand and a voice to those that, that necessarily don't have one. So let me, let me join in um, with Janelle here. And I, I super, super encourage you all to ask questions. Um, nothing is taboo. I'm an open book. Janelle, you're here. And I was just saying how much of an open book I am. Um, but I encourage whoever is watching and joining in on this conversation and listening to, to how we feel just to ask questions. And we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, nothing is off limits because this conversation is necessary. So, um so Janelle, just starting with you, just tell everybody about yourself. Yeah, so again, I'm Janelle, um, originally from Texas. So I um, traveled a long distance to go play Division One volleyball at the University of Louisville, which is in Kentucky. Um, and I so enjoyed that process. And yeah, I mean, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. So I mean, I lived through it and, and still going through it. And um, I love it. Uh, it. It has a lot of ups and downs because I love the people who um, have embraced me. But during this hard time, um, it, it's important. It, it's sad that somebody had to die for a lot of people to be woke. However, it's important now that um, we all talk about it and we, we get on some common ground. Yeah. And I think that even our private conversation that we just had before you joined in is the the situation with George Floyd is not uncommon within our community, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and our allies who are not people of color, specifically who are not black. One, it's okay to say black. I tell my husband I'm in an interracial relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him all the time I am not African American. I am a black woman. Right. And it is okay to say that I am a black woman. And mm -hmm. I think that that's even taboo for a lot of people to, to speak right. on and say. So I, I, what I was saying was George Floyd was the first, I think, for the, I call, the, I call it the default race, the, the, the white people who are friends, who we love and we acknowledge. Mm -hmm. I think that for them, this was the first time that it was undeniable. And I yes. think that it it scared them. It we're kind of numb as black people. We're kind of numb to it uh -huh. because we can we can. It's like we're screaming into an abyss oftentimes. And right. I think that this conversation is is crucial and necessary. But for for people that are privileged, for people that are white, for people that don't live in this space and don't take on these struggles and these traumas and these and this 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 idea that your skin color is a weapon for them to see that video and to see those pictures and for it to be something that's so undeniable i think that this is why the conversation has started um and i think it's so super crucial to have 
to have as many allies. But again, I'll pose this question to you too. Have you had those difficult conversations before we get into like your volleyball <laughs> career and, and things like that? Have you had those difficult conversations with people that aren't allies? Because we can we can be with people that are, are white or or other nationalities and yes. on our side. Like, but again, we're we're screaming into an echo chamber at that point. What are some hard conversations that you've had to have? Um you talking about recently or just overall? Yeah, just recently and overall, and we'll get overall. into the depths of like volleyball and college. Yeah, clubs okay. And we'll I'm with you. Depth. So recently, conversations with people have been successful on, on my end. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm thankful for uh, a lot of people willing to learn and be educated. I mean, that's the first hurdle is you recognize like, okay, I, I need to dive into this. I, mm -hmm. you know, there's we have talked about. Um, you know, there's technology and we can send them a book. We can, you know, request and all I'm this stuff. It. But yeah, but at this point, you have to want to learn and you have to want to um, move past this through us. And yeah, you have to want to be educated in this area. So recently, conversations for me have been uh, pretty good. Uh, in the past, uh, I would say more of like my middle school and high school years, it was extremely, oh my gosh, extremely difficult to talk to um, my peers and, and teammates um, and to have these bold conversation. And why uh, did you find that it was difficult? Talk, talk, about, that, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I found it was difficult because it's kind of like I didn't have anybody to back me up. I was the only one. It's like I represent the whole race <laughs> during yes. that time. So, um, so finding my identity um, at that age, at that young age, it was that, that was hard for me to to stand up for myself and and to feel supported. Um, so I I, I kind of felt like a lot of people they in high school they kept voting me. This is one thing um, they kept voting me for most athletic, most athletic, you know, because mm -hmm. I played basketball and volleyball. And okay, I appreciate that. However, there's more to me. Mm -hmm. than that uh, I didn't feel like a lot of my peers were getting to know who I was and that you know I'm obsessed with Jim Carrey and his comedy at that age and that you know I love chocolate you know just the little things nobody was really <laughs> getting to know me so when I had conversations with my peers at that age they weren't willing to really um they would listen but it's not like they really received it they're just like okay mm -hmm. we'll let her talk you know um or, or I'm being mm -hmm. a good friend and so they felt like what they did was enough, um, but it wasn't because um, we weren't, we were barely scratching the surface on topics like that. Yeah. So, so now in hindsight, you being mm -hmm. an adult and you seeing everything that is happening right now and your experiences, you said that that went back to middle school. So what, you're 10 in middle mm -hmm. school, 10, 11? Yes. Yeah. In middle school. So those experiences, those traumas shape you and they shape you yep. moving forward and how you interact with people and how, how you have, did you have a desire to fit in was what you were saying and you feeling like, yeah, they were just thinking that that was enough. Mm -hmm. How was that, how is that now contributing to your overall idea and desire to speak out right now? Yeah, I mean, with that question along, that just hit a lot of things. I mean, you know, we can be on here all day talking about the different avenues um, and different ways to answer that question. One thing that kind of stood out in terms of me trying to conform or, you know, was mm -hmm. I conforming or not conforming was, uh, I mean, plain and simple, my hair at that. Um, that was a struggle for me. I was not in my hair you know the kinks the curls the the naturalness um yeah i just i was surrounded by others where it was straight or they can curl it flip it bop you know wash it and go and keep it moving mm -hmm. and um i never envied them but it was just like huh like well i can do that too i'll just add in some hair so that <laughs> was a struggle for me to really um embrace who i was going into uh high school and a little bit into college so, um, because I, I did kind of want to conform and, and, and be liked and then hopefully if they'll like me, then they'll start to get to know me rather mm -hmm. than let me be myself. And then that will um, attract the, 
uh, appropriate people into my space. So do you feel that that, like, uh, we're going back to the Janelle that was in high school and middle school, do you think mm -hmm. that that happens now with a lot of, of kids in the Black community where they're trying to conform? Like, I, I know, for me, honest, full-blown, that I just got comfortable with my hair. Mm -hmm. I've, I've shaved my head several times. I love the <laughs> fact that I can okay. do so many different things with my hair. Yes. And, yes. And, and being a club coach, you know, predominantly white sport, these girls come and they, they, they see it. I don't, I don't, I don't get offended at all because mm -hmm. it is my opportunity to educate them. Yes. And so I take it as uh, a, a joy to say, yes, my hair can do this. And mm -hmm. this is why it can do this. And I take it as an opportunity to educate because the girls that I coach, and you've been in a couple of my practices, they're great mm -hmm. girls. They're mm -hmm. just not, they're not informed and they're not yes. involved in a, in, in an environment that says, Oh, yes. is she like yesterday, she, her hair was not like that yesterday. Right. Right. Like, like, they what, the and <laughs> like what just happened? Like, that's amazing. Um, and you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm taking on the privilege of, of introducing them to new, yeah. new things. Yeah. Um, but it's so crucial for you to even, even mention that conforming, mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with image. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that we can't change about ourselves is our skin. Mm -hmm. So the idea that even though you recognize that there were some differences and there was this, I, the, the need to feel accepted and to, yes. un and to be understood, it started with your hair. And mm -hmm. that is yes. something that's super, super crucial, super, super enlightening, because a lot of people don't even see it as that small, minute situation right. where, you know what, I wear a straight wig, I don't wear a big curly afro, because <laughs> I'm conforming to the image of what others may think is, right. is the, the default, the, the necessity, this is how, mm -hmm. this is what success looks like. And I love how you um, even put yourself in the position to like educate and let and like explain to them mm -hmm. um, ab about, you know, your heritage and about your hair and and, and how you you change it up, because that's super important. I feel like um, a lot of my um, right, right friends and peers, um, they just don't know, because mm -hmm. um, honestly, the, some of them have legit been in a bubble. They haven't been out into the other communities. Um, I I grew up and I was uh, kind of sheltered a little bit. You know, I didn't. I wasn't able to just pop and go wherever I wanted to. I was sheltered with my uh, my parents and and everything. However, um, that's so important just to uh, enlighten each other, and and that's where I know that we'll get to just sharing your stories and um, and being receptive to that on both ends will play a huge part and um us moving uh, together so how, how how are you doing i, I should have started that <laughs> out i should have started this whole situation <laughs> out with how are you doing because i am i'm wanting to shed light not necessarily again we're not we're, we're i'm not on here to give you all any lists of movies or books like i think that we're past that like again you know we're past kneeling we're past giving you information because me as a black woman, it's not incumbent upon me to educate you yeah. in some in, in my oppression. Like that's not that's not a thing. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. how like, are you mentally doing given the climate, given the pandemic, given the the racial divide that you're seeing really rear its ugly head in this country? How are you doing? Um, I'm doing better now. Um, mm -hmm. It was overwhelming and just a lot in the beginning um being in Kentucky like all my family my immediate family they're here in Texas so being in Kentucky when things shut down I was just like I should probably be with my family and not knowing uh that restaurants and things would get uh we would be quarantined for this amount of time would happen so um yeah I was I wasn't scared but I was just like okay this is a lot a lot's happening at once and then once we are all kind of getting used to being quarantined and things are starting to open up in stages, we, uh, we, um, yeah, we just see on the news everything that's going on with these individuals and lives being taken. 
and uh, people of color um, getting tired. And for me, I was exhausted because mm -hmm. I, I see that. And there's ways I believe that the black community where we're so used to it, we get numb. And I think we got to a point um, during this time where we were like literally, we first of all, you just had a quarantine. <laughs> you know, we're all, you know, now we're, we're getting out. Then this happens, and it's like, I'm over it. I'm tired. Something has to be done. Um, I, I watched a little bit of the conversation with Maya, where it's just like, um, I'm not going to just sit here and and keep having. She didn't say this, but I took it as uh, for myself and for the people. I'm not going to sit here and just accept these. Uh, friendships when really you're probably more of an acquaintance yeah like you know yep. because uh of your actions and, and not um being maybe considerate of my feelings or what may be going on wanting mm -hmm. to have those conversations so um yeah it was in phases i'm so much better now um and just with a lot of prayer and um i'm in my word daily 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 i kid you not but uh it's been it's been better yeah. Is that how, is that something that you rely heavily upon is, is just prayer to kind of ease your mental to kind of, you know, release the tension of, you know, leave it up to prayer. Like as, as, as humans, like there are things we can control, right. Yes. And we choose to control how we react to situations. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that with a, but there are mm -hmm. often times where I find myself not being able to hold it in. Yes. And I, I call I call that petty Mondays. Because yes. sometimes <laughs> because sometimes people get you there because of pure lack of understanding. And mm -hmm. I found that as we have these conversations, I'm losing friends. Yeah. Because it is at a certain point it's about right and wrong. And there, sh there should be no debate on racism. There should right. be no debate on inequality. And yes. if you, if you considered me a friend, mm -hmm. then there should be no way that then you can turn around and put blame on those that are gravely oppressed or those right. that are in so deep of a struggle. And I, yes. I think this stems back to when the pandemic started, there is, it the pandemic exposed a lot of deficiencies in the education system and the healthcare system. It exposed mm -hmm. so many things that the black community, the black experience that mm -hmm. we have to fight for and struggle with on a daily basis. Yes, I have yes. to fight for my biracial kids to get the same, yes. the same idea of my daughter is extremely smart. She needs to be this. Why am mm -hmm. I still in the school system, a very good school system, in a school that I'm still asking for my daughter to be challenged? And yeah. then me as a black mom, mm -hmm. looking like the angry black woman, when all I am asking for mm -hmm. is my daughters to be challenged. So I think the pandemic exposed a lot, again, yes. health and, and education, but the racial divide comes with the lack of leadership, but also just, we are tired. Yeah. We are absolutely tired. And yeah. so our mental right now for those that I like, again, Maya and I talked about it earlier. I'm not a protester. Mm -hmm. I went out, <laughs> I went out and I walked and I just, I looked, I cried because it was beautiful. And it was an idea of, if this many people need to be heard, then there is a bigger problem. There yes. is a huge problem. So where is my mental going to be focused in? Because mm -hmm. now things are opening back up. So now I have to get back to normal. But my normal before everything else was coaching volleyball. So mm -hmm. now I have to go into a, back into an arena full of predominantly white people and individuals who I care about. Yes. but who have not acknowledged that they see me at all. So what type of attitude am I coming in and I am, and, and how am I going to now approach this? Because mm -hmm. I'm no longer going to stay silent. I'm right. no longer going to, to not say, okay, that, that might not, you shouldn't say that, or this is how I'm feeling. And if you want to acknowledge it, I need you to do that. So mm -hmm. like, 
so tell me about your experience. Let's go back and tell me about your experience as a student athlete, first and foremost, mm -hmm. um, here at Louisville. And what did you, did you, did you see any, or did you feel any kind of hurdles that you were, or hoops that you were having to jump through just simply being a black student athlete? Yeah. Um, to answer that, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit. Sure. Like, and explain like a little bit of like my foundation since I mentioned, I kind of like, I put it in there okay. so that everybody can know um, a little bit more about me. My foundation is like, I'm a believer. So when I see this hatred and I see chaos going on, I know that that is not from my God. He does not create that. And, um, and racism um, is, is in the Bible. So if you're a believer, please like look into that. And so that way you can get grounded in the word. Um, and so having that foundation, and that's what I go, I reference that a lot when I go through situations. That's kind of, that's my safe place and my secret place to go to and be like, okay, Lord, like, you know, what, what do you want me to do with this situation? So um, being a black student athlete, and going into uh, college, especially on the D1 level, um, that was, uh, first I was just overwhelmed with excitement because I'm moving away from home. I got scholarship, like, whoo, this is huge. Um, some of my teammates took me under their wing and really showed me the ropes and embraced me. And they were of all color. I mean, black, um, I don't know, you Becca say, I don't know what Lula is, but you know, just different countries, different <laughs> <Yeah>. colors. <laughs> and um, they embraced me um, because uh, number one, I was there, they saw me like, this is my teammate, so this is my sister, okay? Our common goal is to win games. And at the end of the day, I'm gonna choose who I want on my team to win this game. And I think that's beautiful about being a part of any sports team is that uh, you, you, I believe um, that they look past the color. I, was, I would say most of them do. They would look past the color and they would look at that talent and what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. um, so I focus more on that and, and with my skill um, because at the end of the day with being a student athlete, you know, I wanted to win games. Um, I wanted to make sure I was using my scholarship wisely and get my mm -hmm. degree. Um, you know, they use us for our talent. Why not? Use you had a, you had an agenda. You yeah, had an I, agenda. <laughs> I mean, I had it had yes, an agenda. laid out. Um, so coming in with that mindset was was healthy for me and it, it was good. And then as you're in the locker room, as you're getting um, a better understanding of who your teammates are and, and even their background and during Yes. Um, while I was at uh, Louisville, I think, um, yeah, somebody got elected into the house. And so during that transition, it was difficult for me because I remember it was like before a game. And um, yeah, I was just kind of overwhelmed because I didn't feel like people, we were listening to each other. And I don't think I was listening to other people. So when you say someone got, a, you're talking about uh, the House of Representatives. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm just making sure. <laughs> making sure. <laughs> yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, continue. Sorry. Yes. So, um, with that being said, is when things happen, I feel like people we need to take a deep breath and as as well as me and listen mm -hmm. to each other. And I felt like during that time, you know, nobody was really listening. We were just settled on let's agree to disagree. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, I saw a little bit of a shift and a divide, but as I got to learn more about my teammates and, um, where they came from, truly embrace who they, they were, because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I really did. I, I, I love all my teammates. There are times where I still didn't feel like it was reciprocated. Um, and people would be surprised and, and I would tell people, I mean, I have no shame because this is who I am, but I told people like, look, I did actually grow up privileged. I want, and I would say that not to be like, oh, whoop de woo, but like, like, no, like, you are already judging me. You are already assuming that, you know, uh, I'm a angry black person or this or that, or I'm always, anytime you talk about this, I snap on it. Like, there's some things 
that I have zero tolerance in. And I know there's some things that you may have zero tolerance in. And so you're not going to let that conversation linger without you knowing where we stand. Um, but I had, to, I had to let people know that, first of all, it's, it's not my money. My parents worked hard. We broke generational curses so that we wouldn't have to struggle like they struggled. Mm -hmm. um, and as people got to hopefully learn that about me, then they were able to see, oh, okay. And, and really, um, yeah. So I wanted to explain that a little bit. So going back to something you just said about, you know, some the image of you was you're not wanting to be the angry black the angry black girl mm -hmm. and like you you know me i i have no no qualms with like nope that's not happening like this is what we're gonna do like nope that's not fair so you didn't have an issue with speaking out but when you mm -hmm. did did you feel like it wasn't being heard because they just saw you as the angry black woman um, I was after that, I'll just feel just empty. I'm like, mm. oh my gosh, that was a lot. And, and, and that's where we start, you know, really getting, it's like mental health where it's like, it's so exhausting mm -hmm. to have to explain something that should be understood. And also, I mean, with you as a mother and, um, and as a coach and as an educator, um, mm -hmm. on, on my end, definitely on your end as well. Um, it's exhausting to try to explain to, to kids and people um, something so simple um, mm -hmm. but that you may believe uh, is simple. So after those conversations, I would be drained. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to interact or talk to that person again. But now I, I have a better understanding of who that person truly is and how they really care um, about my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And are you finding that that more people are choosing not to care or that they care and don't know what to do? I would say it's the latter. I would say that I have more people who care and don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're just, I, I personally feel they're just kind of letting the time pass. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm just going to wait till things die down. And I'm gonna do, and maybe, maybe they're saying, you know, I'm gonna do better in the way that I think, you know, my own biases and, and maybe how I interact with people. I, I feel like um, the people around my circle are trying a little bit, but they're still kind of just waiting for like things to just blow over. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't see a lot of active people who are having and taking these conversations um, into their home. Um, and, and even with maybe some parents as well. Um, I don't see or feel a lot of that, but mm -hmm. um, I do see them. I, at least on my end, I do see them trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about club volleyball. Okay. So I, again, I played basketball. Basketball, when I, when I would go through AAUs, that was, that was the sport I thought was going to be my ticket to college and scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until one of my teammates said, hey, you should think about doing volleyball and I went to a small all-girls school it's now shut down like it was it's great school but now it's no more in the archdiocese but being from Chicago and again AU basketball there was no level to my knowledge in my community in the black community where there was club like I didn't know anything about club volleyball mm -hmm. so Tell me about your experience in club volleyball and now you even being, you know, an educator and a coach in Louisville at a predominantly black school and what mm -hmm. that looks that looked like for your girls. Cause you you elevated the program at Central High School here in Louisville, Kentucky. So what mm -hmm. did that look like for a talented group of beautiful black girls mm -hmm. not knowing a world crazy outside uh that is the club volleyball world what was yes. that like what was that experience like uh what was the experience like coaching them yes coaching yes. them it was um it was really good it was very very humbling like oh my gosh I because I, I came in um and I was hired to build a program and I'm like 
I hadn't really, really coached seriously ever before. So I was just like, okay, all right, I mean, I can teach skills, but build a program that involves a community and et cetera. But when working with these young ladies and it being humbling, I came in and I realized that there really, there was no structure. Um, the, the girls came in and they, they treated as just recreational, just pop the ball over the net and, you know, um, just go about their day. Um, it was more social. Mm -hmm. And I, I really had to be, I'm, yeah, be a disciplinarian. I had to go in, I had to put in that structure. This is how we're going to run it. You know, we're not going to have people come into our house and walk over us. Um, and um, yeah, it was time to, to build that community and culture within the team. And then we'll worry, it will expand and people will see that where um, it will turn into a program and where the uh, community outreach would happen. So I enjoyed, uh, I love the process and with these young ladies who, um, some of them watched me play. And so mm -hmm. that kind of brought them in to try out or, uh, yeah, to the tryouts or even just try out volleyball for the first time. Cause I know, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a few girls who it was the first time touching the volleyball and next, you know, by the end of the season. I mean, they're rocking the serves over the net. It was really cool and encouraging to see. Um, I loved every bit of it. it. It was difficult at times because my girls did not, not some of my girls did not have access. And that's where like the club comes into play and they didn't have the free courses. So I put myself and, and I was, I'm not, I was being plain with them and I put myself in that position. And I said, y'all, if you don't have to, like this amount of money, if you don't have this or whatever, that's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have me, I have the keys to the gym. We can come in, but you just let me know and I'll show up for you. You know, I'll bring in, I'll make phone calls and have people come in and volunteer or, um, and, and yeah, or, or I can go and try to talk to some of these other club teams. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that way we can work something out. So I was really trying to empower and encourage the girls to, use volleyball as a platform to mm -hmm. elevate and get to where they need it to be. Um, and it was really cool. I'm so thankful to say that um, I had one girl this year who accepted a scholarship to go play um, for a college. And that was, that's huge for me because I knew it could happen, but mm -hmm. sometimes you need that right person in your corner to push you there. Absolutely. And we talked mm -hmm. about, Maya and I talked about earlier, how, how critical it is to have, coaches mm -hmm. good coaches and coaches that that show up for you and i think that in again a predominantly white sport full of male coaches and female coaches but no coach that necessarily looks like me mm -hmm. you know you've got you've got tanya in texas who's an assistant associate coach you've got sharon clark who's been a head coach at butler for for many many years yeah but I can tell you now, even being within the sport, I can't, I can't name off and reel off names of black mm -hmm. men and women that coach a great sport. Volleyball is an exceptional sport and, and an exceptional tool to elevate any athlete because mm -hmm. it gives you that mental aspect. You have to think about why you're doing things. And you have to be, you're, it's, it's strong. It's a powerful sport. So to have a coach that just shows up, I think is, is critical. And yeah. I think that at that oftentimes I show up for my kids every day, but do mm -hmm. they show up for me? <laughs> do they think that a sport <laughs> like volleyball, who is heavily dominated by white America, white men, white women, do they show up for me and think that I know what I'm talking about, even though I am a black woman. And I find that that is a huge discrepancy in a lot of places because parents kind of control some of the environment for their kids when that it's right. recruiting and coaching and they know what's best for their kids and they need to rely, yes, on those coaches to help provide success for them. So what are some differences that you've seen mm -hmm. coaching club and, and playing club and then coaching a predominantly black team yes. and 
those, you know, the ways that you show up for those athletes, the ways that you show up for every athlete, how was it different? Was there a difference? Uh, on the coaching side? Yes. Yes. So um, one thing that came to mind as you were talking is like, uh, and being a black coach is accolades. And so literally it was like, oh, Janelle Jenkins, she's done this, she's done this, da, da, da. Like, you know, here is what she's accomplished. This has to mean she's a good coach. Right. You know? Yeah. And so with, with that, that resume, and, and everybody has their resume, but um, it's like they highlight that to, to say, no, no, no. Just because she's Black, you know, doesn't mean she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's done this right. and this and that, you know, diving in deeper. So I, I would uh, interact with people who would bring up you know, what I've accomplished. And I, and I so appreciate people doing their homework, uh, especially if I'm about to coach your child, you want to know who's in mm -hmm. with your child. I respect that 100%. But I think I heard that enough from folks where I got to a point where I'm like, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it was a, it did get kind of uh, overwhelming uh, at a point. But when I was coaching these young ladies, um, not even focusing on Central because I was a predominantly black school. So mm -hmm. representation was huge. So, I mean, they, they would hang on to every word I said because they're like, oh, you made it? And yeah. you look like Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that representation matters. And uh, just like you, I mean, I, I never, yeah, I never had a black coach um, mm -hmm. growing up, but I did have people invested in me um, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where, uh, I got to be where I am today. But on the end of me coaching um, uh, other people, it's it's been different, but it's been good. And the reason why I say it's been different um, is because when I would do like one-on-one -on -one training, sometimes I would have to travel 30, 35 minutes and leave maybe Louisville area and go to mm -hmm. another town. Yeah, another county. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, and, and give lessons to these young ladies where um, where maybe I had access at this gym. It's like, no, if you come here, like, you know, the fee and stuff will be lower and we can get a lot of stuff done. Mm -hmm. And so the environments of them feeling comfortable, oh, I'm not that comfortable to come over here. Can you meet me here? Um, and Or I'll pay for your gas, da da da, da. So mm -hmm. it's... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, that to me was uh, an adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what kind of tips can you offer or would you offer for, for Black girls who need someone to look up to, who are, who's looking for representation and looking for a, a safe space in the sport of volleyball? Um, what can you tell them? What can you tell them? I would tell them um, not to be afraid. Uh, go, I mean, with social media, I mean, go follow some of these, um, these black girls on the USA team or on your local um, college team that's nearby in your community. Go follow them, go support them. Um, don't be afraid to ask them those questions and really do your research. Uh, it's crazy how volleyball, the volleyball world is so small. And, mm -hmm. and if you're a girl of color, that's a smaller group. And that networking right there, I mean, you can reach people well, um, within a heartbeat. I had told one young girl um, last week or the week before, I said, I'm probably about one or two phone calls away from, uh, from an Olympian, uh, from a black girl who played on the Olympic to just one or two. If I call this girl, then she can probably call her. Um, or maybe another phone call to get the agent. Who knows the process? Um, and that brightened up the girl to let her know that if you really want to be in this volleyball community, like you can and you will have support. Um, so yeah, go follow uh, some of these players on Instagram. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And also, if you are on a predominantly, um, maybe most of y'all are, but if you're on a predominantly um, white team, I mean, embrace who you are and then make sure that you um, continue to increase your skills and you go to the coach. Hey, coach, um, you, you know, I, I noticed that my playing time has been down. What do I need to do to get better? Not why am I not 
place yeah. and then yeah. you know, we start pulling our, our skin color card. That's so easy to do, but like, no, you, you know, like, what do I need to do to get better? I want playing time. I want to go mm -hmm. to college. I want to be the first in my family, you know? Yeah. So um, just having enough confidence and courage um, uh, will go a long way, but to get that confidence and to get that encouragement, um, definitely reach out and, when you see that if you're playing club and you see the other black girl at the you know facility, <laughs> yeah, girl. <laughs> you know, we're in this together. You know when you lock eyes. Yeah. People, but yeah. 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 We're in this together. So what now I would I would flip that question. What would you mm -hmm. what would you say to um a white girl, a white mm -hmm. athlete? Because I know, and it's one of the questions I know someone in here who's watching, Frank, he's, he asked, you know, why has the USA national team been silent on this issue? Why haven't there been a lot of those players that have come up and have spoken out and um, have mm -hmm. pushed for, have just used their voice and pushed for change? Um, yes. You know, Lindsay has afforded the opportunity for, for me to even be on this platform to kind of shed light on some things. But why... Why is she doing it? Why aren't the players that are experiencing it and in the depths of it and in the throes of it? You know, you've got Haley Washington, who's who's playing with the national team. Jordan Thompson, who who, mm -hmm. who did an interview and has yes. said that the face was blurred out. And the first thing Jordan said she thought was, that could, is that my dad? Mm. And that was, that is overwhelming. Like, I get chills. in that interview because she mm -hmm. she got emotional a little bit and she said I thought uh, that could be is that my dad and I don't think that a lot of of white athletes will ever need to a ask that question and so right. what do you say to 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 mm -hmm. white athletes young and professional who aren't speaking out is it a question mm -hmm. of well why aren't you speaking out or mm -hmm. do you not know what to say? Or is your silence complicit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, is it? <laughs> I like, yeah, like what's going on? What I would say to them, and because we're having this open and honest conversation, you, you see a lot of us um, women of color, black women who, and black men, but right now focusing on the us, we're, we're we're strong, we're bold, and we want to, we want to have these conversations. So we have literally opened it up to the point where we want you to feel comfortable to ask us these questions because we want to work through this together because okay. it's not going to help, um, you know, or, or excuse me, we can talk to our black girls and be like, okay, we got to build each other up. We got to do this. We got to do that. But we're not talking to the other side of, hey, this is how you need to embrace us. This is how you need to receive us. Here or what questions do you first. have? Like, yeah, this is exactly. open dialogue. Don't be afraid. Exactly. And so I would start off after, you know, having that short, um, building that relationship with them. And you want them to be comfortable. But asking them, like, what do you want to know? Or, or what's stopping you from, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe making a, making a small post? Or what's stopping you from having this conversation? And then kind of diving into that. And um, I definitely put myself in, posi in a position, and I think we all do, to support them in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and because and, I want to empower all girls and, mm -hmm. and have them understand that, like, our voice is crucial. It matters. We can turn the, we can turn the head of men. <laughs> like, I mean, we can go deep into that. And, yeah. um, and having those conversations and, and, and asking those questions. Mm -hmm. um, like, hey, if you were some... Uh, a white girl um hey what what is it you want to know about me anything go for it ask me mm -hmm. open a book and then maybe they're like oh i've never had opportunity to really um do that and then go from there um i, I would also encourage um my uh, those players if they're in the volleyball world and if they're playing as well i would really encourage them to Definitely look at the way, evaluate themselves, because we all have biases. You know, as mm -hmm. an educator, I have to leave oh. that at home. So I'll come into class and I'll be like, 
quo, okay? But evaluate yourself and be like, wait, okay, how do I treat uh, this teammate compared to this teammate, okay? And not saying you have to make a list and all this stuff, but be <laughs> a reflection. Be honest. Be honest. Yeah. And then, I mean, go and grab a co uh, coffee or get something to eat and really try to get to know her just like you got to know your other friend who, who looks like you. What did y'all do? If y'all got your nails done, why can't you get your nails done with her and have those conversations? Um, so be open to that. Uh, and, and we're not saying at the end of the day, we're ha we have to be best friends, but there's just this yeah. respect and this bond where it truly uh, becomes unbreakable. Yep. And I, 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 I totally agree with you. I had, I've had many of these conversations, um, a couple of conversations with my parents on, okay, what can I do? And, and this is when I said, I'm not giving you a list of things like you're an adult, you can make your you can make your own decisions. I said, you just need to be able to choose to do right by, <laughs> by humans. You'd like, this is yeah. not up for debate. Like, why are you like, like, this is, this is just not a thing. Like you just right. choose to do right by humans and you mm -hmm. make sure that in any of your interactions, I told, I told one of my, my friends, it says, I'm not trying to infiltrate your friend group. Yeah. All yeah. I am trying to do is have you understand that your friend group is not the only group of people that you will be involved with and that you interact with. Yes. And if you all share the same ideas, mm -hmm. then that needs to be known to me because I know you. Yeah. And if I know you and they say something, I'm going to be, I'm going to need to feel that if they say something out of pocket, Mm -hmm. that even though I'm not there, you mm -hmm. check them. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, then that's yes. not an ally for me. That yes. is not someone that I can yes. consider a friend. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you check them in front of me, great. But if you don't check them when yes. I'm not there, then we have a bigger conversation because that comfort mm -hmm. level needs to be expanded. And that conversation needs yes. to happen all the time yeah. when I am not present. <laughs> yes. It, it, is the word integrity, is that the word? I, I, I was trying to find it's word. Accountability. I think Account that's the word of the day, like accountability. Yes. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that's 2020's mantra is like, we just want everybody to be held accountable right. for yeah. what they do and what they say and own it. Like if yes. you are this type of person, let me choose to not interact with you or let me choose to embrace and we can have a conversation, mm -hmm. but it's all about accountability. It's all about how we feel. It's, it's about how are we mentally, right? Mm -hmm. How are we adjusting to this? Because I know for a fact that a lot of my white family members, again, I'm in an interracial relationship. Yeah. Been in one for nine years mm -hmm. and there are still things that, they are realizing but yeah. you know what they love me mm -hmm. yes and yes. they will go out and they will fight for me yes and it's not it's not a hey like my husband who i have been with for nine going on 10 years mm -hmm. he will check someone real quick and i am afraid i mm -hmm. i hold him back but that's yeah. the type of allyship that i want when I am in my arena of volleyball, when I am in the corporate world and something is so unjust and unequal in the treatment of any individual, like mm -hmm. that is all anybody that is protesting, anybody, they're just asking for justice and equality. So. And there, I wanted to piggyback off of that because we want to know, and we may not talk about it all the time, but now we are, but um, black folks, they like, they want to know without asking you, they should know it like in their head, like, I know he has my back. I know she has my back. I know if, if, you, if you were put in a situation, mm -hmm. I know that you will fight for me. I know that you will say the right thing. And I mean, I can honestly say there are some people where I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know because I've seen the way that you've reacted. I've seen your action. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you have, I don't know if you, you might leave me. 
mm-hmm. leave me hanging. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, let other people out there know is is that we we kind of we have a feeling of where you stand, but when you're mm-hmm. when you're bold in it, you know, and whether it happens in front of us or not in front of us, um, we kind of know which side that you're on, mm-hmm. um, and as we are um, being surrounded by family and friends and things of that nature, we really start to process and understand like, okay, these are the people who are in my circle. These are people who, who, who ride or die for me. These are people who are for me and who I can rely on for And, and we're going deep into for my safety, for mm-hmm. my life, for yeah. you is also for my kids. Do you have my kids back, yeah. you know, yeah. and diving in deeper to that. So yeah, that's real. And I think that in the world of volleyball, we're we're circling around with just specifically the USA national team. Again, I will forever shout out Alexis for giving a face that there are black volleyball athletes who take carry the sport and who are in Cameroon, who are in South Africa, who are in Brazil, who who love this sport. Mm -hmm. But what I want want to say to especially the USA national team is I want everyone to be as bold and to come out and speak and know that your teammates Mm -hmm. who have been a part of Olympic teams, who have Mm -hmm. been in the gyms with you, who Mm -hmm. are struggling, I want what I want to see is that recognition of, I know you are struggling. Mm -hmm. I don't want, I'm so tired of the collective corporations and the collective uh, community Mm -hmm. saying, oh, we've taken a deep dive into our our diversity and inclusion. Well, no, you haven't. If right now is the only Mm -hmm. time that that you've seen it as a problem. Like I don't want the black struggle to be a trend right now. And I definitely don't want it to be a trend Mm -hmm. in the sporting arena where we have been screaming for so long to hear us. And all we're wanting is to be as women. We're just wanting to be paid the same as women. We want, we want an equitable, equitable share in the entertainment that we provide Mm -hmm. as, as female volleyball players in a predominantly white sport, we want to be seen. And we mm-hmm. want to not just be seen because we're athletic. We are smarter in the game and we understand the ins and outs of the game. And mm-hmm. we want our white teammates to stand up and be there more so in the front line yeah. because you all have the space to, to do it. Card- yes. you, got, you got the green card to, to speak up and speak out. Yeah, and, so. and we're, we're dealing with and we're talking to that majority uh, because uh, at this point, the, the minorities, I mean, we're relentless in this uh, arena right now because we're just like, you know, after all these incidents, like we're tired and, you know, we, y'all, you cannot deny what's going on. And mm-hmm. so we are literally telling and asking and having the majority to like, you need to embrace, it, embrace us. We need yep. to be working together. Um, yep. And and so yeah, I'm and be sure. and be just as relentless. Yes. I love that word. I love that word. Mm-hmm. Be relentless. Mm-hmm. I am asking my white counterparts <laughs> in the sport of volleyball to be just as relentless in your voice um, for change that that we as Black women have been screaming at the top of our lungs for so long. <laughs> so all right, Janelle. Thank you. This was good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.